Welcome to Nuclear Hot Seat, the weekly international news magazine keeping you up to date on all things nuclear from a different perspective. My name is Libby Halevi. I am the producer and host, as well as a survivor of the nuclear accident at Three Mile Island from just one mile away. So I know what can happen when those nuclear so-called experts get it wrong. This week, we examine President Obama's recent visit to Hiroshima through the eyes and thoughts of Rick Wayman, Director of Programs and Operations at the California-based Nuclear Age Peace Foundation. Rick discusses the bombs and the problems, yet comes up with easy steps any of us can take to help pressure our government to change pathways and work towards disarmament. Then, Dr. Helen Caldicott shares her thoughts on nuclear war more poignantly than you have ever heard her. Plus, we've got our ever-popular Num Nuts of the Week feature, Nuclear Reactor Doc, and cover report, and more honest nuclear information than certain high school chemistry teachers are allowing in their classrooms. More on that later. And all of it will be coming up in just a few moments. Today is Tuesday, May 31st, 2016, and here is the week's nuclear news from our perspective. Mini news this week. Staff at France's 19 nuclear plants have voted to go on strike amid escalating protests against labor reforms. In India, a major accident at the Tour Mid uranium mine killed three workers, injured eight, and up to six may still be trapped in the mine. In Japan, the government has decided to lift an evacuation order put in place after the Fukushima Daiichi disaster began. This is for the city of Minimasoma. The evacuation order will expire on July 12 of this year. Also, the compensation for victims will be eliminated at that time, forcing over 10,000 people to return to their homes whether they want to or not. In a massive understatement, Tokyo Electric Power Company has announced that the solid frozen wall that they have been trying to create at its Fukushima nuclear power plant disaster site is falling short of expectations and has hit an unexpected glitch and the soil is not freezing. Oops! And now, Nuclear Hot Seed, none that's out of the week. Westinghouse, which is owned by Japanese company Toshiba, has been building an AP-1000 new nuclear reactor in China that is more than three years behind schedule and has been under construction for over eight years. They just announced that this facility has passed its pressure test. But wait. They only tested for 10 minutes at non-operating temperatures. When, If you compare it to the California Code, it should be tested for 30 minutes at full temperature without leakage, undue distortion, excessive permanent expansion, or evidence of impending failure. But no, Westinghouse, which is under pressure to finally step away from the construction process, says inspection of more than 1,800 welds found no leaks. Well, you didn't test for them, guys. And don't you think that regulation should be more strict for nuclear applications and not the bottom end of safety? And that's why you, Westinghouse, with your AP-1000 reactor in China, are this week's Nuclear Hot Seed, none that's out of the week. In the U.S., in Idaho, a cleanup contractor says radioactive material contaminated the skin and clothing of three workers during an incident earlier this month at a U.S. Department of Energy site in the Idaho desert. In North St. Louis, rainwater runoff and sediment samples from the Westlake landfill are back from the EPA, and one of the samples from along St. Charles Rock Road outside the fence has been found to have rad waste from Westlake in it, the moms are right yet again. Horrible thing to be right about, but they're right. Duck and cover report. The Indian Point Unit 2 nuclear reactor will reopen in late June, despite the fact that during an inspection in March, federal safety inspectors discovered some 227 of 832 baffle bolts were degraded or cracking. <laughs> At Exelon's Byron Nuclear Facility in Illinois, on May 25th, it was discovered that equipment on both units there is considered not to be adequately protected from tornado missiles. Ah! 
Same story, same date for Braidwood in Illinois. <laughs> And at Vogel in Georgia on May 25th, an automatic reactor trip on lowering steam generator water levels slammed that puppy from 100% power to zero. And it's on hot standby with no updates coming. That's our duck and cover report. We'll have the week's featured interviews in just a moment. But first, the fifth anniversary of this show is just two weeks away. Who'd have thunk it? Five years of providing news, interviews, information, and attitude. All of it aimed at getting rid of nukes and figuring out what in the world to do with all that radioactive waste. And none of this would have been possible without the support of you, the listeners. That's right, we take no ads, there are no under-the-table bribes, no offers of speeches, consultancies, and trust me, I am not about to turn into a paid pro-nuclear lobbyist. There's not that much money on the face of the planet. But there is a need for money to help keep this show running. So if you care about Nuclear Hot Seat, if we fill in the blanks in your information stream about nuclear, if we make you laugh, think, help you know what to do with your anger, or you just like to sing along with the theme song, we would appreciate a donation in honor of year number six getting started. No amount is too small or too large, need to say that. But if you're on a budget like most of us these days, consider what I like to call the Starbucks donation. The equivalent of what you pay for a cup of coffee with maybe a little on the side. Either that or a great tip. It's a wonderful way to help the show. And at the same time, if you make it monthly, you'll be supporting us on a monthly basis. There's a lot we want to do moving into year number six, and your donations will help us get there. So let's have that cup of imaginary coffee. Go to NuclearHotSeat.com, click on the big red Donate button, and know that whatever amount you offer, what it signifies to me is that you care about the show, you care about the work, and you want to see it keep going. In advance... I thank you from the bottom of my heart for any assistance you can provide. On May 27, President Obama became the first sitting president of the United States to visit Ground Zero at Hiroshima. In one of those confluences of time and energy that I never could have planned, May 27 was also the day of a long-delayed and long-sought-after interview with Rick Wayman. Director of Programs and Operations at the California-based Nuclear Age Peace Foundation. Rick serves on the Board of Directors of the Alliance for Nuclear Accountability and is co-chair of the Amplify Generation of Change Network for Nuclear Abolition. Rick had a lot to say about President Obama's trip, as well as the Marshall Islands lawsuits against the nine nuclear-armed nations, the so-called legality of nuclear war, and some action steps that any of us can take to help turn around this nuclear weapons mess that we find ourselves in. Rick Wayman, welcome to Nuclear Hot Seat. Thanks so much for having me. First of all, tell us about the Nuclear Age Peace Foundation, what it is and what it does. We are a nonprofit organization. We're based in Santa Barbara, California. And we work here in the U.S. and around the world for the abolition of nuclear weapons and to empower peace leaders. We've been around for over 30 years. We were founded in 1982. And what we really like in particular about being based in Santa Barbara is that while a lot of what we do is, is work on policy issues, Normally, groups that work on these types of issues are based in D.C. or maybe New York. We really like being far away from that center of power. It allows us to really keep our idealism and really uh, stick to what we believe in and not feel like we have to make compromises to gain access to political insiders. So we really love being based out here in California. And we feel that that gives us a, a unique perspective and a unique voice in this movement. We believe that the U.S. and all of the nuclear armed nations in the world, all nine of them, have a legal obligation 
to both end the nuclear arms race and negotiate in good faith for nuclear disarmament. Those are not things that we see happening. We unfortunately are seeing quite the opposite going on right now. So we are strongly opposing here in the U.S. the Obama administration's plans to spend at least $1 trillion dollars over the next 30 years to modernize the nuclear arsenal. And internationally, we are working in support of the Republic of the Marshall Islands, which has filed lawsuits against all nine nuclear armed nations for the breach of international law. It already exists under international law, under Article 6 of the Nonproliferation Treaty, as well as customary international law that there's an obligation to negotiate for nuclear disarmament. We'll move further into the Marshall Islands in a moment, but I think it's important to acknowledge that we are speaking on Friday, May 27, 2016, which is the date that President Obama visited Hiroshima, the first sitting president of the United States, to visit ground zero of the first atomic bomb to be exploded on the planet used in war. Because of the time difference and the national dateline, Japan is one day ahead of us. So we're not being psychic here. We already know what has happened. Give your view of this historic visit that President Obama has made to Hiroshima. Well, the first thing I want to say is that it takes a lot of courage in the cynical world of U.S. politics for a president to visit Hiroshima. It's almost 71 years since the U.S. used that nuclear weapon on the city, killing at least 140,000 people. But President Obama today just became the first sitting U.S. president to visit Hiroshima. That gesture in and of itself is quite significant, I think. We heard the White House over the past few weeks vociferously proclaiming that this was not going to be an apology for President Truman's decision to use a nuclear weapon against the civilian population in 1945. Putting that aside, I think that President Obama has plenty of his own actions that he could have apologized for. I mentioned briefly earlier the $1 trillion nuclear modernization program that is currently going on. That's an Obama administration policy. That is not something that was cooked up under a previous administration and is being continued. This is something that has happened over the past eight years under President Obama. Basically, what he's proposing and what is starting to be in motion already is the production of new nuclear warheads and new delivery systems, submarines, bombers, and intercontinental ballistic missiles that will still be in use 70 years from now, in the 2080s. These weapon systems are still predicted to be in use at that time. So this is not something that is in line with a vision of a nuclear weapons-free world. And it's extremely disappointing to me that the president had the space, I think, to actually do something to eliminate nuclear weapons during his time in office, and he did not do that. He said plenty of good words about nuclear disarmament, but in the end... Actions speak louder than words, and the actions that we have seen have been quite in the opposite direction than nuclear disarmament. That contradiction struck me as well. Some of his comments at Hiroshima include, Why did we come to this place, to Hiroshima? We come to ponder the terrible force unleashed in the not-so-distant past. We come to mourn the dead. Their souls speak to us. They ask us to look inward, take stock of who we are, Someday the voices will no longer be with us to bear witness, but the memory must never fade. The memory fuels our imagination. It allows us to change. And then he says, let us now find the courage together to spread peace and pursue a world without nuclear weapons. Yet this is exactly what it seems like he is not doing, and he has set us on the path to more nuclear weapons and delivery systems in the coming years, even after he's out of office. That's absolutely right. And it's really a shame because those words, if you're just reading those words on paper without the context of what the budget says and what our national laboratories are doing and what our production facilities are doing right now, those words sound great and the words are great. But like I said, 
words without actions to back it up are totally meaningless. And, and that's unfortunately the situation that we find ourselves in right now. So I am very disappointed that this is where we find ourselves right now. I'm not without hope. There are definite signs of hope. If there's one shining piece that I can take from the president's visit to Hiroshima, it would be that it opened up some space in the mainstream media and also in alternative media, of course, to talk about this issue. This is not something that the media is particularly fond of discussing, nuclear weapons, other than in the context of Iran or North Korea or terrorists, it is not something that we hear about very often. We have heard in the mainstream media over the past few days voices of survivors of the Hiroshima bombing. And I think that's a very valuable perspective, especially for Americans to hear. I think it's easy to forget that these weapons ultimately are designed to kill people, to kill civilians. And the people who were affected in Hiroshima are just like you and me. Given that this country does seem to have been put on a path to nuclear proliferation. What might we do to capitalize on this current window of opportunity when the subject is up for discussion to perhaps steer thought and hopefully action to follow that will move us towards a lessening of the nuclear presence and the nuclear threat as presented by our country? One movement that we're seeing internationally right now that is very strong and having a huge impact, it's called the Humanitarian Initiative. And basically what it is, it's a joint effort by civil society groups led by the International Campaign to Abolish Nuclear Weapons and many other NGOs that are a part of that campaign, as well as the International Red Cross and a number of courageous non-nuclear armed countries. Basically, they are highlighting the undeniable and catastrophic humanitarian consequences of nuclear weapons to say that these weapons just absolutely can never be used. If they are used, there is no humanitarian effort that could lessen the impact of them. If there's a, uh, a use of one nuclear weapon on a city, it would be very difficult for medical personnel to assist anyone because the medical personnel would be injured or killed just like everyone else in that city. We also see it in the circumstance of a what they call a limited nuclear exchange between India and Pakistan, where maybe 50 nuclear weapons on each side are used against the other's cities. That would cause extreme climate change. It would block enough warming sunlight that we would see temperatures go below freezing nearly every day of the year. That obviously would prevent crops from growing, and models have shown that that would lead to what's called a nuclear famine, where up to 2 billion people worldwide would be killed. So even if nuclear weapons are used on the other side of the world, none are exploded here in the U.S., people in the U.S. would still be not only impacted and inconvenienced, but would starve. So this is a very real problem that every single human being in the world needs to address because it affects all of us. The humanitarian initiative has been very effective in putting that position forward, and there's quite a bit of momentum to achieve what they're calling a ban treaty, which would be a treaty that would outlaw the possession of nuclear weapons. Essentially, it would further stigmatize the countries that possess nuclear weapons, make it clear that they are acting illegally, and just as with other classes of weapons like chemical weapons, biological weapons, landmines, cluster munitions, nuclear weapons need to be banned as a step toward their elimination. You mentioned ICANN, which is the International Campaign Against Nuclear Weapons. And I know that they have had a program moving forward called Don't Bank on the Bomb. Are you involved with that? And if so, tell us a bit about it. Don't Bank on the Bomb is a fantastic report. It is led by a group in the Netherlands called PAX, P-A-X, they research in depth the companies around the world that are involved in the production of nuclear weapons, what they call nuclear weapon producers. 
But they don't stop there. They also look at the financial institutions around the world, the banks that are financing the nuclear weapon producers. And what they've been able to do, they've had a lot of success primarily in Europe with some of the banks, getting them to specifically divest, to pull their funding from these dirty companies, from these nuclear weapon producing companies. We've seen recent success here in the United States in Cambridge, Massachusetts, where the city council voted unanimously to divest its pension fund of nuclear weapon producers. That's a billion dollar plus pension fund. And, you know, that's just another way to, first of all, to draw attention to the fact that it's not just countries and governments that are involved in making nuclear weapons. This is a largely a private enterprise. Companies are making billions of dollars off of the production of nuclear weapons and on the perpetuation of the arms race. It's a really important angle to look at. And as I mentioned before, the Don't Bank on the Bomb report looks at banks that are financing these companies. I was shocked to find that my what I thought was my local bank here in Southern California, Union Bank, is actually owned by a Japanese corporation, Mitsubishi Financial Corporation. Uh, that's not its exact name, but they are listed in the report as financing nuclear weapon producers to the tune of billions of dollars. I was then faced, now that I had that knowledge, I was faced with a personal moral dilemma. Do I want my money involved in a financial institution that is funding nuclear weapons? My answer was absolutely not. So I went through the time and the effort to move my money out of that bank and into a local bank that does not fund nuclear weapons. I was able to educate some people along the way, people that work at my local bank branch. They asked, why are you closing your account? And I got to tell them about it. I got to explain the fact that this bank funds nuclear weapons. So it's a great opportunity not only to keep one's moral conscience clear by taking your own money out, but also to educate some people along the way. And you never know what will come of that. So I'm a big proponent of this report. Uh, you can find it online at don'tbankonthebomb.com. They update it almost every year, and it's really strong. I, I can't recommend it highly enough. And we will, of course, have a link up on the website under this episode, Nuclear Hot Seat number 258. Moving this along, you recently co-authored a report for the Alliance for Nuclear Accountability entitled Trillion Dollar Trainwreck. What was that report about? That report details a lot of the proposed and programs that are already in action around what they call the modernization of the nuclear arsenal here in the United States. This is the trillion dollars that President Obama has already earmarked, and that's the program that has been moving forward, correct? Yeah, it's projected to cost $1 trillion over the next 30 years. And that would be to upgrade the warheads, the nuclear warheads, the delivery systems, the production facilities, and the command and control structure. Basically, the entire nuclear weapons enterprise will be quote-unquote modernized under this proposal. So the report, Trillion Dollar Trainwreck, goes into detail about some of these programs that we know about right now. And every one of them is over budget. Many of them are blatantly unnecessary, and a lot of them have a, a general lack of accountability. Again, this goes back to the fact that contractors, for-profit corporations, are really leading this effort, and there's a very glaring lack of accountability there. When they mess up, does anyone's head roll? Often the answer is no, and I'll give you a great example of that. In Tennessee, at the Y-12 nuclear complex, your listeners might have heard of that a couple years ago, Sister Megan Rice and two other activists called the Transform Now Plowshares entered the site and conducted civil disobedience at the highly enriched uranium facility at Y-12. Uh, this is supposed to be the Fort Knox of uranium, impossible to get into. And I'd like to point out that Sister Megan Rice at the time was 83 years old, and her cohorts were similarly late 50s to early 60s. 
Yeah, that's right. These were not super agile athletes. <laughs> These were regular people with no special tools or anything. So that is the facility that we're talking about here. The Obama administration is proposing what they call a uranium processing facility, which would produce secondaries for nuclear weapons. Secondaries are what put the H in H-bomb. They magnify the explosive yield of a nuclear weapon. So there were contractors working at the site on the design of the facility. They got almost all the way finished with their design at the cost of $500 million, I might add, a half a billion dollars just for the design. And then they realized, oh no, the building that we've designed will not fit the machinery that we need. It's not tall enough. We can't fit these things inside the building. So they had to scrap it. So that's a half a billion dollars down the drain. No one has been held accountable for that. And they continue to throw good money after bad on that project. And we've actually not even seen a documented requirement for a capacity to produce more secondaries for nuclear weapons. So this report is just full of examples like that. They're real head scratchers, but you know, they're, they're also just great examples of things that we need. We hear a lot of talk in Congress about how there's this huge deficit that our country has. There are so many programs, including the ones that we outlined in Trillion Dollar Trainwreck, that are just flat out unnecessary. So we're not only saying we need to stop the further production of nuclear weapons, we're also saying let's save some money while we're at it. Is this plan to modernize the nuclear arsenal even legal? I would argue no. As I mentioned at the outset, there is an existing obligation under Article 6 of the Nonproliferation Treaty. To quote from that, Article 6 calls for parties to, quote, pursue negotiations in good faith on effective measures relating to cessation of the nuclear arms race at an early date and to nuclear disarmament. End quote. First of all, in that article, we hear good faith negotiations. That's not happening. Cessation of the nuclear arms race. When you're qualitatively improving every single weapon in your arsenal, I think that qualifies as an arms race. It might not be a quantitative arms race where you're building up your numbers, but it absolutely is a qualitative arms race where you are improving what they consider to be the quality of a nuclear weapon. And then we also hear negotiations for nuclear disarmament. Those are not happening. The Nonproliferation Treaty has been in effect for 46 years, and we have not seen Article 6 fulfilled in any way. That's extremely disappointing. But it also highlights the fact that I do not believe that the current modernization plan is legal. International law, treaties that have been ratified by the Senate are considered to be the supreme law of the land in this country. Therefore, the law requires an end to the nuclear arms race and negotiations for nuclear disarmament. It's as clear as that. What you bring up now leads into the actions of the Republic of the Marshall Islands, which in 2014 filed landmark lawsuits against the nine nuclear-armed nations for failing to comply with their obligations under international law to pursue these negotiations for worldwide elimination of nuclear weapons. The Nuclear Age Peace Foundation, as we mentioned at the beginning of this interview, is deeply involved in supporting the Marshall Islands in what are called the Nuclear Zero Lawsuits at the International Court of Justice and in U.S. Federal Court. Explain to us what these lawsuits are about. So, like you said, the Marshall Islands filed these lawsuits in 2014, both at the International Court of Justice. That was against all nine nuclear-armed nations. The Marshall Islands filed separate lawsuits against each of the nine. And then also another similar case in U.S. federal court against only the United States. Basically, what these cases are arguing is that the nuclear-armed countries are in breach of their obligations. In the Nonproliferation Treaty, there's a, a basic deal that happened as part of the treaty. The nuclear-armed nations agreed to negotiate the elimination of nuclear weapons. 
the non-nuclear armed nations, the vast majority of countries in the world, agreed that they would not acquire nuclear weapons. So what the Marshall Islands is saying here is, look, we've upheld our end of the bargain not to acquire nuclear weapons. You have not upheld your end of the bargain. So what they're seeking is judicial support for that position. They're seeking injunctive relief and uh, declaratory relief. So basically, they want the court to say, yes, nuclear armed nation, you are in breach of your obligations and you need to take this action to initiate negotiations by a certain date. The Marshall Islands would hope for within one year of a declaration by the court. I think it's important to mention the Marshall Islands is not asking the court to say what the negotiations have to achieve. They just want the court to say, you have to negotiate. So that's at their core what is happening. International law is an interesting thing. The International Court of Justice, which is in The Hague, it's not respected by all nations. In fact, only three of the nine nuclear armed nations accept what is called the compulsory jurisdiction of the international court. That would be the United Kingdom, India, and Pakistan. So the U.S. isn't under that? Correct. The U.S. back in the 80s withdrew its acceptance of jurisdiction because of a contentious case filed by Nicaragua against the U.S. They preferred to withdraw from the court rather than to have that case heard. So it's not only the U.S., but also Russia, France, China, Israel, and North Korea. Those are the nuclear armed nations that do not respect the jurisdiction of the international court. So right now, we have three cases that are going forward at the International Court of Justice. And there were preliminary hearings in March, just a couple of months ago, in The Hague. There is also a case that is currently in the federal court system here in the U.S. That's currently in the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals. These are really quite courageous actions by the Marshall Islands. We've not seen any other country up to this point willing to take this kind of a stand. And we're very excited that the Marshall Islands is doing this, and we back them fully. We are also part of a consortium of over 100 NGOs around the world that are working to support the Marshall Islands. Also, we've had millions of people, over 5 million people, sign a petition in support of this action by the Marshall Islands. Which brings us to the obvious question. Why the Marshall Islands? That's a great question. The first thing to note about the Marshall Islands is that they, as a country, know better than most people what the actual effects of nuclear weapons are. The Marshall Islands were used as a nuclear weapon testing ground by the United States from 1946 until 1958. During that time, the U.S. conducted 67 nuclear tests in the Marshall Islands, mostly atmospheric tests, which spew radioactive fallout, not to mention the sheer terror of seeing a, a nuclear explosion. Over that 12-year period, if you add up the total explosive yield of those 67 tests, it averages out to 1.6 Hiroshima-sized bombs every day for 12 years. Oh my God. So the people of the Marshall Islands have suffered greatly, as you might imagine, the health effects not only affected the people who were there at the time of the testing, but some of these effects are passed down through generations. So the cancers and other health effects that we see from radiation are still continuing to this day. I would also add there are many islands in the Marshall Islands that are uninhabitable still 60 plus years later. And in many places, you're not able to eat the food that's grown there. You can't have the coconuts, for example, because they're still radioactive. So the Marshall Islands, like I said, they know firsthand what the effects of nuclear weapons are. And what they're seeking to do in these lawsuits, they're not seeking any financial compensation. They're not asking for any money as part of these lawsuits. They want to ensure that nuclear weapons are abolished. 
so that no one has to experience what they experienced under the U.S. nuclear testing regime. Whether that would be through nuclear testing or through the use of nuclear weapons by accident or by design in wartime. For anyone who wants to know graphically and specifically what was done to the Marshall Islanders, I recommend the film Nuclear Savage by Adam Horowitz, which I've now seen twice and is devastating in its indictment of not only nuclear weapons, but what the United States did to those people. And we will have a link up on the website for you to be able to access this. Rick, what effect do you expect the cases that the Marshall Islands have brought to have on the international perception of and actions on nuclear weapons? Well, we don't know for sure, of course, uh, what effect they will have. What we have seen already in the two years that the cases have been active in the court system is a change in the rhetoric that we hear. We do hear a lot more about the obligation for nuclear disarmament being universal that it's not just something that the signatories of the Non-Proliferation Treaty have to do, but it also includes the four countries that are outside of that treaty, which would be Israel, India, Pakistan, and North Korea. Under customary international law, the same obligation for nuclear disarmament negotiations exists. So we've seen a change in that. We've heard high-level UN officials talk about that. We've seen a change in rhetoric from other high-level officials. Even Pope Francis has talked a lot more about the actual requirements for nuclear disarmament. So we would expect more of that to happen as it becomes clearer and clearer to people that the Marshall Islands is correct in their legal interpretation of existing international legal obligations. But, you know, we also hope that this compels countries to take action. That's ultimately what this is about. We need the nuclear armed nations to stop engaging in nuclear arms racing. We need them to sit down together and negotiate for nuclear disarmament. And our hope is that they will listen to these cases, uh, that the, of course, the hope is that the judges will return decisions in favor of the Marshall Islands position, and that this could be a start of what needs to happen, which is all countries negotiating a phased, verifiable, irreversible, and transparent process to go down to zero nuclear weapons. From your mouth to somebody in power's ears, you know, this is excruciatingly important work that you and the Nuclear Age Peace Foundation is engaged in. Where can people go to learn more about the group and how they can support the work? Well, we have two main websites that we operate. One is www.wagingpeace.org. That's our, our website where we have a lot of information about nuclear weapons, nuclear disarmament, peace. We have a lot of opinion pieces that we publish on our website. The other website is nuclearzero.org, and that is a campaign website about the Marshall Islands nuclear disarmament lawsuits. So I would encourage listeners to check out both of those websites. At Waging Peace, you can sign up for our email list. We have a monthly newsletter that goes to our 75,000 subscribers around the world called The Sunflower that gives updates on the top nuclear weapons stories. And also we do periodic action alerts to our members when there's an opportunity for them to make their voice heard in what is happening around nuclear policy, whether in Washington, D.C. or at the U.N. or elsewhere. Rick, this has been a tremendously informative interview. We've been pursuing this for a while, and the timing I consider to be uncanny, given the events that just took place in Japan with President Obama. Do keep us informed of any progress that is made on the lawsuits or the push for disarmament. Let us know how we can help you. And for now, thank you so much for being my guest this week on Nuclear Hot Seat. Thank you so much. I, I really appreciate the opportunity. And, and thanks to you and your listeners for the work that you do for a nuclear-free world. Rick Wayman of the Nuclear Age Peace Foundation.
For more information about the organization, go to wagingpeace.org. And to learn more about the Marshall Islands lawsuits, check out nuclearzero.org. Of course, there will be links to both up on our website, nuclearhotseat.com, under this episode, number 258. This next interview is one that I did back in February, and I've been holding on to for just the right moment. And this is it. I interviewed Dr. Helen Caldicott at the Adams Next Door Symposium in North St. Louis, which focused on issues of unremediated World War II nuclear weapons waste illegally buried at the Westlake Landfill, where it is polluting the atmosphere around it, and, oh, by the way, just happens to be in the pathway of a five-year-old impossible-to-put-out underground fire that is within 500 yards of the nuclear weapons waste that we know is there, to say nothing of any waste that may have migrated. So it's a very dangerous situation, and, of course, Dr. Caldicott spoke brilliantly and compassionately on the subject, and that was on Nuclear Hot Seat number 244 from February 23, 2016. At the end of that interview, she shared her thoughts about a speech coming up for her on nuclear war and weapons. She was then on her way to Germany to give that speech for International Physicians for the Prevention of Nuclear War. While we all know Dr. Caldicott for her ferocity and genius, in leading this movement for so many decades, I'd never before heard her speak this poignantly about not only what she does and what she's going to say, but why she does it. We were speaking in a hotel lobby, which explains the music in the background. When you go to Germany and you're going to be speaking at IPPNW, what is the nature of the speech you will be giving? The title of the conference is From Chernobyl to Fukushima, and they asked me to be a keynote speaker. I think I'm the last keynote speaker. But they've got so many excellent specialists from all over the world addressing these issues. There's really nothing left for me to say, I think, at the end. And they wanted me to talk about renewable energy in countries and how the movement towards renewable energy could produce a sort of melding of peace in the world. And I said, look, that's not my expertise. I don't know really about that. What I'm deeply concerned about at the moment is the impending threat of nuclear war, which is simply not being addressed by the presidential candidates, the media, throughout the world. And it's really more severe and urgent than it was during the height of the Cold War. I mean, I sometimes say to my family, I'll be home if there isn't a nuclear war, and I really mean it. America and Russia are practicing nuclear war drills at the moment. They are antagonizing each other by going right up to the border of Russia and practicing NATO war drills. America's going to put more soldiers into NATO right up against the border of Russia. China's put its weapons on a high state of alert, I read the other day, and so have Russia and America. And there are so many things that can go wrong. Computers can make errors, people make errors, people are fallible, people are hacking into the early warning system in the Pentagon every day. Russia's being antagonized and provoked by the neocons in the uh, State Department. The neocons orchestrated the coup in the Ukraine. And so Yanukovych fled because of that, and he was a democratically elected prime minister. And they put in a dreadful guy, and I can't think of his name, Poroshenko. And he's working with Nazis in the Ukraine, of which there are many. It's very complex because the EU wanted the Ukraine to join the EU, but if you join the EU, you have to tighten your belts like poor old Greece. And, you know, the people lose their pensions, they lose their ability to get food from the government and education and the like, and the people didn't want that. But uh, the neocons, Victoria Newland and Robert Kagan and others who are dominating the State Department in this area, I don't know what Obama's thinking, they prevail. And that's what's happened, and it's very serious because it's like Russia moving over to Canada and saying, well, we're, we're taking Canada into our sphere of influence. I mean, America would blow up the world if that happened. She nearly did blow up the world when there were missiles in Cuba. America's so arrogant, and America promised Gorbachev when the Cold War ended that they would not enlarge 
NATO beyond where it was at that moment in Western Europe. But what it's done has enlarged NATO in all those little countries that were freed from the Soviet Union right up to the border of Russia. How provocative is that? And the reason is that after the Cold War, Lockheed Martin, Boeing, General Dynamics, et al., they lost their ability to sell weapons because they were not needed, the peace dividend. So Norman Augustine, who was the head of Lockheed Martin, and they called at the Pentagon, they said he really ran the Pentagon. He went to all those little Eastern European countries and said, if you join NATO, you'll have a democracy. To join NATO, you have to spend $3 billion on weapons to join NATO. And he talked them into it. And so the poor little countries that had hardly any money bought all these weapons, joined NATO, and they moved it right up to the border of Russia. What's happened is really obscene. And I think that Putin is being very restrained in this particular situation, much more than America would be in this situation. And, you know, Russia and America own 94% of all the nuclear weapons in the world. They're the only ones who could blow up life on the planet. They're the real terrorists. They are the real terrorists threatening the planet. And if America doesn't decide to abolish nuclear weapons along with Russia, and I know Russia would because she can't afford this, and her early warning systems are degrading and dilapidating, and she's scared. If America takes the lead like she could have in the 80s and the 90s when Clinton got in and dropped the ball, then Russia and America could disarm together, and only then would they have the moral authority to say to other countries, you're not to have nuclear weapons, we're leading, you follow us. But at the moment, they have no moral authority at all. And how dare America talk about North Korea having a single nuclear weapon <laughs> when America's got thousands of nuclear weapons, many on high status alert, ready to go with a press of the button by Obama. The whole thing is quite extraordinary to me. And as a physician and someone who reveres life and just the process of biology and how wondrous it is that this little tiny rock in the whole of the universe has this extraordinary life complex of life that we, we are threatening to destroy probably the only life in the universe. It's almost beyond my imagination. Given that it's so massive and so pervasive, what can people do? What can an ordinary average person do to turn this around? Okay, so what people have to do is become educated. And it was Jefferson who said an informed democracy will behave in a responsible fashion. This democracy, if it is one indeed, is totally uninformed. The media have dropped the ball. Most of the media now are young. They're a new generation. They have no idea about the Cold War. They don't know about nuclear weapons. They're ignorant. Furthermore, Rupert Murdoch would probably want a nuclear war the way he reports everything, although he's just fallen in love with that Hall woman. It happened in the 80s. When I first came here in 78, most people said to me, it's better to be dead than red. And I thought, these people are psychotic. They'd rather have a nuclear war. Yes, we don't want to be communist. So then I got together the physicians, 23,000 of us, and we taught people about the medical effects of bombs dropping on Boston, Seattle, New York, and the like, and people got scared, as they should be. And from PSR was spawned psychologists for social responsibility, educators, architects, you name it. And the whole country woke up. Mind you, I had a lot of television exposure because I had a, an agent in Hollywood who worked for me for free and got me in vogue and life and time and the like. So through the media, we educated the public. And the public rose up. And in five years, 80% of people were opposed to nuclear weapons and war. We had a million people in Central Park, the biggest rally this country's ever seen. And we were winning. That's political power. I could go to Congress and Tip O'Neill, who is chairing the House in the Congress, would come out of the Congress, meet me in his office, and say, what can I do for you, doctor? That's political power if you have people behind you. If you have an uneducated populace, the corporations can do their will, and they are intent on destroying the planet in more ways than one. This is such difficult information, and a lot of people I see just want to bounce off it. I try and make it accessible to people. Mm. But you've been doing this for so many years. How in the world do you keep going? Well, you see, 
I'm an actress, and if I have a big audience, first you have to establish your credibility by giving them lots and lots of facts as a physician, and then I can see them sort of relax, and then I, I go for their souls and who they love and what they value in their life. You've got to change people's lives that night, otherwise it's not worth doing it. And so I know I can do that. And so because I have that ability to mobilize millions of people, which I've done in the past, I have hope. But at the moment, very few people are asking me to speak anyway. And so that's not working. I'm writing books, but very few people read books. I guess because I'm a doctor through and through, I'm practicing global preventive medicine. And I have to do that because this is my vocation. It's like being a teacher or a nun. And I won't stop until I die, because what else can I do but to try and save not just the human race, but, you know, I went whale watching the other day, and it was extraordinary, these baby whales with white tummies leaping out of the water and swirling around. And I thought, this is what this work's about. It's about those whales. And as my roses bloom in the spring, it's, that's what I value and don't we all? Don't we all? Dr. Helen Caldicott. Activist shout out. My deep thanks and appreciation to Tara Douglas Johnson and the great crew she put together for taking over the posting of each new nuclear hot seat on Facebook on Tuesdays and Wednesdays. This takes a huge burden off my shoulders, having to launch the show after I've spent all day producing it. Way to go, and brava, Tara and the crew. Here's today's final thought. The nuclear industry strikes yet another low blow in its cause of co-opting honest conversation of issues regarding its technology of death. Here's the story. Because misery loves company, I get together with a friend every week to sit around her kitchen table and we together do our financial work, balance checkbooks, pay bills, and commiserate over corn chips and other gluten-free goodies. Over the years, yes, years that we have been doing this, I've gotten to know her now 16-year-old daughter pretty well, and this girl has heard a lot about nuclear issues. About a week ago, this girl, let's call her Dina, called me in tremendous distress. That's because her chemistry teacher, who was obviously pro-nuclear, was propagandizing the class big time. First, this woman had a speaker from the Navy come in to lecture the kids on all the wonders of nuclear energy and why we need it so badly. Dina was the only one in the entire class who challenged this man on the issues of nuclear's deadly waste. And she happily told me that he fumbled. He had no answer. And so he just kind of mumbled to himself and then moved on to another topic because he had no answer for the waste, because there is no answer. But even worse, and the cause of this phone call, was last week when the class was shown that lying pro-nuclear propaganda film Pandora's Promise, which maintains that the only way out of global warming is through clean, put that in quotes, green, put that in quotes, proliferation of nuclear reactors, a premise soundly countered by, among others, Linda Pence Gunter of Beyond Nuclear, in her piece, Pandora's False Promise. But getting back to the teacher, this woman provided only the film, no countering information, no balance, nothing from the anti-nuclear perspective. She just cherry-picked the partial truths and downright lies that were spun in the best of Hollywood filmmaking tradition, meant to mold ignorant people, young and old, into a lifelong belief in the wonders of nuclear energy to save the world. Such a piece of garbage. But to top it off, the teacher then assigned the class an essay as to whether they were pro-nuclear or anti-nuclear and why. They had to justify their position with footnotes and references. However, not once did she offer a shred of evidence against nuclear. Dina knew enough to want to take the anti-stand, and she came to me and we had a good half hour at the computer, while I gave her links to footnoted articles and mainstream media news stories that support our position 
along with a list of talking points for her to cover. By now she's handed in the paper and is hoping that the teacher will give her a good grade based upon how she justified her position, even if it doesn't agree with that teacher's foregone conclusions about nuclear. Meanwhile, we're exploring what can be done about the school to stop this invisible indoctrination from continuing. You see, this school, none of the schools in the school system, can show any film without prior system-wide approval. Pandora's Promise got itself approved. I wonder how that happened, given the millions and millions of dollars put into PR propaganda. And let's find all the ways that we can get this lying piece of garbage out into the world. I think I've got an attitude about this. Now we have to propose films that can also be up there and be seen. It would also be interesting to find out how many other school districts have shown this piece of film as the way and the light thus hijacking the minds and the common sense of our kids before they know that there's another way to think that makes a lot more sense about energy. This is how our genuinely clean, green, wind and solar, anti-nuclear future is being hijacked. It's being stolen from us. When Pandora's Promise first showed up and bombed at the box office, a lot of people thought that it was a joke and that it would go away and be forgotten. But now we see the long-term planning that was put into it. It was never meant to be a hit in the movie theaters. It's a projectile warhead aimed at the unprotected minds and hearts of the young. A lying piece of fecal smear meant to be implanted into the children so that they're infected with this pro-nuclear nonsense. Just like Dina is facing from other kids in her class who smugly know, put that in quotes, the truth, put that in quotes, about nuclear. Bullies come in all sizes. This is a bullying technology. And how low of that industry to bully our children into believing their lies. Dina's parents are talking with me and we're seeing what can be done before the end of the school year to stop this from going any further. I'll keep you posted. This has been Nuclear Hot Seat for Tuesday, May 31st, 2016. Material for this week's program has been researched and compiled from RT.com, Asahi.com, Nikkei.com, DefenseOne.com, DeUnRenard.wordpress.com, HeraldCourier.com, MiamiHerald.com, NEIS.org and Gail Snyder, KWQC.com, MiningAwareness.wordpress.com, Lohud.com, the Nuclear Regulatory Commission, and the activist community of Nuclear Hot Seat, who gathered together on our Facebook site, the blog post one with the logo, which you are all invited to visit and like. It's a great place to network with others if you're looking for information or contacts on nuclear issues in your area. Theme music written by me, sung by Marilee Weber, accompanied by John Barnard, recorded at Winslow Court Studio in Hollywood. Nuclear Hot Seat is syndicated on ucy.tv, activatemedia.org, planetexperts.com, on newszentinel.com, and now broadcast over FCC's airways on WGRN-FM in Columbus, Ohio. We're looking for more broadcast stations, especially community radio stations, that would like to carry the show. So if you know one, please, let's talk. Check out our archive of over 255 shows on the website, nuclearhotseat.com, on our YouTube channel under Nuclear Hot Seat Videos, and on iTunes under Podcasts. And a reminder that your contributions help keep Nuclear Hot Seat the vital force it is for honest, accurate nuclear news with an attitude. So please do what you can this week to help us out with a donation at NuclearHotSeat.com. We are copyright 2016, Libby Halevi and Hardestry Communications. All rights reserved, but fair use allowed as long as proper attribution is provided. This is Libby Halevi of Hardestry Communications, the heart of the art of communicating, reminding you that we have all had our nuclear wake-up call. Now don't go back to sleep, because we are all in the nuclear hot seat. Nuclear hot seat. It's the bomb.